Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thanks for everyone staying, uh, who came to this morning's session on corrosion and uh, hopefully it was educational and uh, we'll have a similar structure this afternoon. Um, I'm going to cover the history of structural strengthening um, primarily because the history will give you an insight really on why things are being done now when Neil and Fabio start to look at sort of the fibre reinforced plastics because there was a lot of information beforehand, a lot of testing that determined the route for FRP strengthening. So I'm going to look at why do structures need strengthening in the first place, what is structural strengthening in the sort of uh, the way that we're looking at it as far as externally plate bonding, what can be achieved by adopting the technique, why certain adhesives have been selected, and what you should be looking for in uh, adhesives. Then how do you maintain the, the durability of the joint, the joint being between the concrete and the steel plates and the adhesive that's the sandwich between uh, the two and transmitting the stresses from the concrete or reinforcement to the, to the steel. The installation process and also quality control and, and testing of the individual components and the, uh, the system. And then again follow that up with a, hopefully a few interesting uh, case studies. Okay, so why do we need, uh, why do we sort of strengthen structures? Could be a number of reasons. One of them is uh, a change of use, i.e. predominantly uh, an increase in loading. Could be temporary, could be permanent, uh, could be uh, a design issue that uh, you may have to add some uh, reinforcement. Poor quality construction, could be structural damage. Earlier on you saw uh, <coughs> one of, in one of Chris's pictures an excavator hitting a bridge. He's absolutely correct. It does happen quite often and sometimes we have to go in there and help sort it out and Fabio will show you uh, another way of, uh, of doing it as well as regards to strengthening. Uh, fire damage. Structures do get damaged by fire. Um, Chris showed that and if there's a, a problem with the, with the steel um, then there's ways that you can still maintain the structural adequacy of that uh, damaged structural element. Probably not so much of an issue here in the UK, but certainly when we start to talk about uh, this technique overseas, a lot of countries do have seismic issues, and it's what we have to offer uh, from that perspective. Appreciate some of you don't just work in the UK, they do actually do work, they do work overseas, so it may be something that hopefully you'll find of interest. Uh, reinforcement corrosion, we learned about that this morning and of course if you do have that as an issue and causing loss of steel to, uh, to the reinforcement then obviously you've got to treat the cause in the first place before you can easily apply any sort of structural strengthening whatsoever and could be loss of uh, pre-stress force as well in a, in a structure. So we really want to try, sort of, uh, try and prevent this happening. Okay, so what is strengthening? It's externally bonded reinforcement which can be bonded to concrete, steel, timber or masonry using steel plates, which is what I'll cover in the history of, uh, of uh, external plate bonding, but then we covered by Fabio and uh, Neil when they start to talk about fibre reinforced polymers and plates and fabrics. And then another part of the system is then the structural adhesives. Um, generally they are epoxy based and I'll, I'll hopefully give you an insight in uh, why they have been chosen to be the sort of the structural adhesive uh, for structural strengthening. So basically uh, if, we, if we look at this as an example of a, a structural element, two bars of reinforcement with a specific load on there and we want to increase the loading we can't really put any more reinforcements in there on the inside, but what we can do is put the equivalent reinforcement on the outside as part of the extra upgrade that's required, which then ultimately would be the equivalent of steel if we designed it the same from, uh, from first principles and the first point of, uh, of construction. From the technical point of view of what can be achieved with the technique is, is increased flexural uh, strength, We've got, so uh, you can redistribute loads around openings. If you take, for instance, a hole out of a, a you know, a quite uh, a shear wall or something, you can distribute loads around, uh, around 
openings, whether it's door uh, openings or, or, or any other type of opening. Improve uh, punching shear and uh, in the structure. Increase impact resistance as well. Very much the highways um, um, authority looked at uh, impact resistance uh, as well uh, with a lot of um, the new upgrading loadings that they were trying to achieve. And, inc and generally we're looking at the increased load carrying capacity of a structure, whatever that may be, some of the, uh, some of the above. From a practical point of view, because the type of plates we're using, whether they're steel or FRP, they're actually quite thin in comparison to other techniques that are around, i.e. steel beams or recasting, reinforced uh, concrete beams under, under decks. As you can see here, this is just a shot of, of a project you'll get a bit more detail on later on, where the steel plates are there and you can apply coating, so visually they actually blend in with, uh, with the structure. Because it's quite a quick way of strengthening with regards to speed and, and everything else that's sort of in within the process itself, it is very quick. You can overcome access problems because you can use certain size plates to get into difficult situations where if you were using uh, beams, it would, uh, steel beams, it would be a lot more difficult. Minimise sort of disruption to existing services as well. Um, if you've got to um, start diverting utilities and things around, then that can be very expensive in itself. So this provides quite a useful, uh, useful option. And also to resolve difficult uh, detailing problems. And here's an example here where you've got a uh, difficult detailing problem on a beam and you've got to avoid voids within the beam as well. Okay, so when we start to look at the background specifically and say, well, when did all this start? Where did it start? It really started way back in the 1960s and uh, Japan were the first people to look at this technique and they used steel plates to start with. Yeah, and you can see an example here of a structure that's been strengthened with, uh, with steel plates. Then what happened when the sort of the highways agency decided to upgrade a few of the structures, going from 32 tons to 40 tons? Obviously, quite a few of the bridges uh, were, were going to fail the criteria, so they needed to be upgraded. So the TLRL, together with the Royal Military College of Science, started to look at the technique in a lot more detail in the in the UK. It's now become a widely accepted practice worldwide and it's basically got a 40 year track record. So there's an element of confidence there uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the process and the system, as long as it's installed correctly, of course, and with the right, uh, right products. And ultimately, it's more cost effective than demolition and rebuild. And certainly if you've got historic structures or they may be listed, you know, and uh, it's always difficult to, um, to actually get to authorization to demolish them. But if they need to be upgraded and need to be strengthened, again, this technique offers that option. 1975 was the first use of the, um, of the system uh, on a bridge in the UK, Quinton uh, Bridge. And uh, all the experience that we have now with, um, with strengthening is the plates have always sort of been around between sort of four to 20 millimeters in thickness, which does give certain problems when they are actually being installed. Maximum length is around about five metres uh, that could be actually manhandled by a team of four and five, so you can see there's restriction there uh, as well in the practical side of things. So here's a team just applying a, um, a steel plate to the side of a, side of a bridge. So as soon as you started to go over five metres, so you're trying to sort of um, cover a span of 20 metres, you're then going to have to have four plates and they're going to have to be lapped in the middle as well. And all the bolts and that have to be calculated. As you can see here. And also because of the high stresses you tend to get at the ends of the plates, then you then have to sort of um, drill in what we call anti-peel bolts. Also with this technique, because of the plates are so heavy and the adhesive isn't strong enough to stop the plates falling off, 
during uh, the curing time, then you have to place some temporary support there as well, and that can be quite um, not only expensive, um, but also it um, it can uh, cause quite a few access problems in itself uh, when you're trying to strengthen the structure. So you can see here, there's a sort of a, a pulley and beam system that they're using to uh, apply pressure to the underside of, of steel plates just to hold them in place for about 24 hours before removing them and then moving them somewhere else for a, another sort of stage of um, the bonding. If we start to look at adhesives, there's quite a few construction adhesives within the, uh, within our, in the construction industry. And uh, the reason that Professor Jeff Mays uh, was chosen by the TRL, he actually has probably the most extensive knowledge of adhesives in the country, still has to this day. And he just happens to be at the Royal Military, of College, uh, Science, uh, Military College of Science. They also use of he adhesives for the military as well, so he's in a very good position to actually advise the TRL on what types of adhesives to use. So if you start to look at the types of adhesives, the key ones really, um, the most sort of structural, semi-structural ones, we've got epoxies, we've got polyurethanes, acrylics and polyesters. And most of those, because they're structural, are generally two-part products, parts A and B, resin and a hardener. And then when you mix them up together, they have a chemical reaction and then the adhesives um, reacts and forms a sort of a, it, it solid, it solid mass. And they're all cold cured as well, so you're reliant on the ambient temperature to cure those products. It's not a, they're not thermosetting as, as such where you get an external source, heat source to, to actually to, uh, start the cure mechanism. It's purely reliant on the ambient temperature and that can have a big effect whether you're actually applying the adhesives in the summer or the winter. So the key things that um, Professor Mays looked at when we're starting to look at structural adhesives were specifically for the plate bonding with steel plates was um, first of all creep resistance. Obviously once you apply the product and it was under uh, stress you didn't want it to start cre creeping otherwise you start to lose the, um, the stress transference in the composite. Moisture resistance as well, particularly if this was the TRL, you're looking at bridges that are in marine environments, generally wet conditions as well, purely with the, uh, the British um, climate. So that had to be quite good. Heat resistance as well. Um, on bridges you can get quite high temperatures, but also when you start to look at other processes which are internal, temperatures can get up to about 80, 90 degrees as well. So that has to be considered. And also because you're using the adhesive uh, not only as a bond filling uh, material, but it's gap filling as well. So it has to, with concrete, can be quite undulating. Um, you've got to fill those gaps so you get a, a fairly even, as much as you can, uh, bond line between the, the steel and also the concrete. So when you start to look at the um, epoxies, they seem to fill most of the criteria that Professor Jeff Mays was looking at. Polyurethanes. Uh, in, in some aspects, yes, acrylics, polyesters, but obviously the epoxies ticked all the boxes. So on, on this basis, this is where a lot of research was done then on different types of epoxy adhesives that were available in the construction industry. One of the key things, obviously, that we have to look at is performance and durability of that adhesive as part of the composite joint. And not all epoxies are the same. It's a very generic term, as is plastic. Plastic can cover lots of different types, as can epoxies. And one of the things he did find was that with he formed this sort of envelope by just mixing the materials up, placing them into water, and just seeing what their water absorption was over a certain amount of time. Now, one of the things with water absorption in epoxies can cause an effect called hydrolyzation. And what that does, it reduces the performance parameters of the, uh, of the epoxy. Now that could be quite detrimental over, uh, uh, over time. And um, so that was one of the key areas that he did find that a lot of epoxies were, were quite different in their water uptake. But also, if they took up water and it was on steel plates, you could have corrosion issues as well. So we submitted quite a few uh, different uh, products uh, as well, but ultimately we came uh, up with one which was satisfied the criteria that was requested 
and, and far exceeded what was expected. And this was with one of our Cicadur adhesives. And of course, you couldn't put our product name in a governmental document. So it had to be described um, in its sort of generic terms. So, so basically, it was a two-part product. Uh, the, the resin itself is, is uh, what we call um, diglycetyl ether of bisphenol A and F blend. And also, the resin um, hardener was what we call an aliphatic polyamine. That really doesn't mean a lot to me, to be honest, because I'm an engineer, I'm not a chemist. But to Professor Jeff Mays, that meant a lot. So, yeah, so that's, that's the generic sort of focus he was uh, looking at on the epoxy ad uh, adhesive. So that was really the benchmark for the future of steel plate bonding. As I said earlier, not all epoxy types are the same. So what he did, he complied what's called a specification spectrum uh, for epoxy adhesives, uh, specifically for steel plate bonding and for the TRL. And uh, you could see the properties here that he was looking at placing onto the bonding surfaces, so he suggested a value of between 2 and 10 millimetres, that was for the gap filling side of things. Uh, shrinkage, obviously had to be negligible, you don't want the epoxy shrinking and pulling away from putting stress or pulling away from the plates. Cure time temperature had to be between a certain <coughs> uh, spectrum as well, usable life, 40 minutes as a minimum. Now this has got to be mixed up, applied to a plate, pushed into position, and 40 minutes actually goes very quickly. So he felt that was the minimum after doing some tests with, uh, with contractors as well. We have something, uh, we mentioned moisture resistance here. He set sort of a level of less than 3%. Our epoxies are, are less than 1%, so we well <coughs> met that criteria quite easily. The other thing was heat distortion temperature or glass transition temperature. If you start to go above this value, then what happens, the adhesive starts to go a little bit plastic. And then, of course, what happens, it loses its sort of performance. So he suggested that 40 degrees C was a minimum. However, we have techniques as well within the system where you can actually increase that heat distortion temperature by what's called post-curing. But I'll come back onto that uh, a little bit later on. Then there was other criteria, which such as flexual mod flo Flexual modulus for between 4 and 10 kilonewtons per millimetre squared, um, lap shear strength, and also what was also important was mixing control. Could you physically see when you mix the two components together that it had been mixed properly? So he suggested um, not specifically colours, but the hardener and resin were completely different colours, but when mixed together formed another colour. So if you applied it and you could see any striations, for instance, of, of the hardener in there, then you could take it off and, and remix it again. And that was all placed into what's called BA3094, which is a strengthening of concrete highway structures using externally bonded plates. That is a document, it's still uh, live now. And that was placed into, uh, so that spectrum was placed into that document to give guidance on selecting an adhesive. Flexural modulus um, is a good way of testing not only the suitability of the adhesive. Um, in the first place, but also it's a good test when you're on site as well, because the contractor can mix the product up, you can put it into a prism, and then it can be sent along, sent to a lab, and they can do a test on to verify that, uh, that what was on site actually is also what has been sort of specified as part of the product uh, as the adhesive selection. So you can see there that that is the setup for a flexural modulus test at beam, four port bending. Then we've got a double overlap shear test. Uh, what happens here is the adherence, the steel, they're grip blasted here and here at, at this bond line. These are bonded together with the adhesive and then they're just pulled apart in tension. You know the force, you know the surface area here and then you can work out what, uh, what strength that joint is. And so that's what a contractor would do. He would use the steel and then he would um, apply the adhesive that had been mixed and then that would be sent off to our lab and they would just do a test and that would determine <coughs> uh, the, the value and whether it complied within the, the spectrum itself as well. Durability of the joint, well the performance of it to start with, uh, the adhesive itself was, was sort of catered for in the specification spectrum. 
what originally wasn't uh, part of the, uh, the specification was long-term uh, protection of the plates for, for the durability. And um, with the adhesive being quite a brittle material, although it can bend, you can actually get micro-cracking within that product. Now, it's not normally too much of it. It's not normally an issue structurally, but if you get moisture in there, moisture can travel along between the crack and then start to induce corrosion along the plate. So we started to look at um, how we can improve the durability uh, of that joint. So we looked at some um, corrosion protection on there. We looked at a micaceous iron oxide uh, product, which is quite strong in, in itself, a two-part epoxy. Plus it was compatible with the, our adhes adhesive as well. And there was a series of tests done. And it was decided that 50 microns, dry film thickness, provided a good element of protection, but also it formed part of the structural adhesion of the, uh, of, of the composite as well, of the steel and the, uh, uh, and the concrete. Now, if you go above 50 microns dry film thickness, you then start to get an adhesive failure or cohesive failure in the, in, in the protective coating. So that's not good in itself, and that's why the criteria was set for 50 microns. So it had to be compatible with the, the, with the, uh, with the adhesive. So we did a lot of this testing with the, Ro the Royal Military College of Science, and they used what's called a wedge cleavage test, specifically used by Boeing, the aircraft uh, manufacturer. And of course, we still had to satisfy the sort of the sheer lap strength that was, that was sort of mentioned and specified in the uh, compliance spectrum. And so two adherents bonded together, and uh, one would be to compare, one would be coated in the uh, corrosion protection, another one would be just bare steel. And then you'd compare them together, you'd put them in a climate control environment, generally sort of had uh, chlorides in the environment, you do it over a certain time, certain humidity, and then you watch and measure this crack propagation and also how it corrodes. So you can see here the corrosion protection is quite, uh, it's quite effective, but along here, um, the steel's already started to corrode. So that helped sort of with regards to extending the life of the technique in itself because we're using steel plates. Now you could ask, well, why don't you use galvanised plates? Why don't you use um, stainless steel plates? Well, the problem is to bond to galvanised and stainless steel is very difficult. Um, you have to get quite a severe surface profile and, um, and so on that basis it was decided because of... Uh, to do with energy and, and adhesion, then it was decided that steel plates provided the best solution at the end of the day with corrosion protection. Also, we didn't want to set up a bimetallic corrosion issue either by using something like stainless steel or, um, or galvanised. So from this, you can see that um, the products that we put forward and that sort of generic term uh, we certainly exceeded the requirements of uh, the compliance spectrum for BA 3094. Absorption is less than 1%. It had to be very easy to apply. A lot of the cheaper epoxies tend to have quite a few fillers in there, just to bulk it out a little bit. But for the contractor's point of view, it then becomes very difficult to apply the product. And on the basis you've got 40 minutes, you really want to have a very sort of um, user-friendly adhesive to, uh, to apply. Uh, Systems fully tested, as I say we did it with the Royal Military College of Science, and they were our in independent testers. And we've got quite a few references as well from the point of view, if you want to do more reading, there's um, Adhesives in Civil Engineering by Mason Hutchinson that gives you all the testing that was carried out um, as well and the spectrum that's there in the, in the uh, BA 3094. Structural use of adhesives by the Institution of uh, Structural Engineers, which is very appropriate as we're in their um, building today. And also there's strengthening of concrete structures where the adhesive is mentioned in there in 3094. So if we look at the installation process now, first of all there's the preparation of the, um, the substrate, the concrete, then there's the preparation of the steel plates followed by the adhesive and then the installation of those uh, plates into position. So the first thing is to sort of test the concrete to start with, and if there's any repairs to be carried out, they have to be carried out to 1504, and uh, generally class R4 mortars, because I said earlier on this morning, 
they have to be classified as structural repairs. And they can be either hand applied, machine applied, or, or, or cast, cast in situ. Then we remove the latents from the concrete, exposing the aggregate. And this is generally done by sort of grit blasting, can be done again by sort of high pressure water sort of hydro demolition, uh, but, but under very controlled conditions. And then is the removal of any dust from the surface. Even if you prepare it with water, you still get an element of dust or, and deposits on there, so you still have to vacuum uh, the surface. And then to check the concrete surface that it's been prepared correctly, you generally do a pull-off test, which is a steel dolly with the, the adhesive attached to it, or applied to it. You, you attach the, um, the dolly to the surface, you wait for the material to cure, you then do a pull-off test, and then in theory you should get a value of around about two units per meter squared minimum. But what you're ultimately looking for is a sort of conical failure in the concrete. What you don't want is an adhesive failure in the interface of the dolly and the, and the adhesive itself. You don't want a failure in the protective coating, and you don't want a failure, a uh, cohesive failure in the, in the adhesive. So it really has to be in the concrete. And it could be that if you don't get that type of failure, you've got to do a little bit more um, surface preparation. Because certain aggregates um, can give you different pull-offs as well. A polished aggregate, you've really got to work hard to really bring that profile and make a coarse profile from it. <coughs> and you can see there, all the aggregate that's been exposed, no latency there whatsoever, the dolly with adhesive on there, leave it 24 hours, come and do a, do a pull-off test. In the workshop, plates are fabricated to the, to the required dimensions, they're degreased first and then they are grit blasted. The reason it's done that way round is that if, because of the production process you get an element of grease on the surface if you grip blast, you can actually force that grease into the sort of macro surface of the steel, which can cause an adhesion problem. So that's done first. And then it's applying the uh, corrosion, steel primer corrosion protection, again, as we said, to 50 microns DFT. Then they get to site, they've been wrapped in uh, some sort of fabric, plastic for protection, get to site, they get put into the position that they're going to be applied to, the plastic wrappings that, uh, are removed. Final degrease on the uh, on the coating the, on the bond line, and then the products uh, mixed together. You can see here, grey, black. Mix them both together, and they'll form a slightly darker grey. But you can see here that it's not been mixed properly at the moment because you've got the sort of the, the dark hardener here that still needs to be um, to be mixed in. So when that's fully homogeneous, then you can apply it to the uh, to the surface. So it's around about two millimetres to the concrete two millimetres to the steel plate, so we get a bond line of around about three to four millimetres. Now, because of some of the temporary works and the pressure that can be applied by the contractor to the plates, there is the danger of extruding the adhesive out between the plates. So, what we normally recommend is to apply some plastic spacers around about two or three millimetres in thickness, so that Whatever pressure is applied, it can only sort of um, extrude the adhesive out of a certain amount. Um, the reason we use plastic spacers as well, not metal ones, is we don't want bimetallic corrosion either forming in, in, that, uh, in that joint. And then they're just simply placed into a position when the adhesive's uh, been mixed and applied. So from mixing to application, you're looking at 40 minutes. And then if there's any subsequent drilling that needs to be done once all the temporary works have been removed, <coughs> then that's carried out afterwards. So they're drilling through the steel, the epoxy, and then into the concrete. Okay, quality control and, and testing here. First of all, we'll know a lot about the steel plate to start with. But what we've got to do is check that the, the plate's been prepared properly, SA 2.5, abrasive blast cleaning. <coughs> and then you can either test the wet film thickness as the, as the primer has been placed onto the steel plates or afterwards you can check the dry film thickness uh, as well. So once they've been tested and, and everything else, then they can come to, uh, to site. Adhesive, <coughs> well, all the testing has been done because it should be proven by the manufacturer that it complies with the, 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 sort of, uh, the spectrum in the first place. But... You want to know that it's been mixed properly and that uh, all the proportions are correct and therefore you need to do some site testing as well. 
So the flexural modulus, that test is identified in 3094, and that's using uh, that test there, the four point bending. Then you've got the lap shear test as well, again mentioned in, in BA3094. We're just pulling the double overlap shear test uh, apart. What isn't mentioned in 3094 is the tensile shear strength. Now, <coughs> if you only do these two tests, it doesn't really give you the full picture. So what we've suggested and what's happened, it just seems to be an industry standard now, you do a tensile shear strength uh, test as well. And then they all get sent off to a laboratory, they do the results, you come back and say, yep, yeah, that adhesive is good, therefore I can tick this sort of batch number off and how it was installed, and that, that's, uh, that's all nicely correct. So the contracts will be issued with, from the laboratory, a mould, and then they just apply the mixed material in there, and they'd fill their polyethylene sort of mould up, and then they put a plate on the top, and it will get sent away for lap shears, uh, and the beams for the, sorry, for the tensile shear, lap shear with the steel, and for the flexural modulus would just be a, a small beam, uh, but half a dozen of them for testing. Once the, um, the system has been put in place, how do you then check that that's everything, sort of all the adhesive is where it should be, covering all the surfaces of the steel and the concrete. <coughs> well, it's a pretty crude method, but it's sort of, uh, it's just a hammer test. Um, and it's, it's, it's just an audible test as much as anything else. And so you just bash the surface very lightly, you don't want to damage the uh, corrosion protection. And if you do get find that there are sort of differences in, 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 um, in noise, then what you can do is you can mark those on there and you can either drill in to find where possibly the cavity is, and then what we can do is resin inject into those cavities, so you then end up with a full bonded length of, of uh, adhesive in there. Now, I think some of the design allows you around about 10%, <coughs> I think, of voids within a certain surface area. The techniques that we, we, uh, we show the contractors generally sort of avoid this sort of um, situation happening. So just a couple of uh, case studies to finish off. Minerva House, Leeds. This one was done in 1989. <coughs> it was a um, property developer that was trying to upgrade the building. It was, um, been, the floor loading has been increased to four kilonewtons per metre squared. 1,200 square metres of plate were, was used on the top surface of the concrete. So you can see here they've used a special A-frame. And where they will actually drill the bolts through eventually to secure them into the concrete, they've used that as a, so they can hang the plate off the, off the A-frame. So this would have been fabricated, <coughs> corrosion protection applied, even though it is internal, degreased in situ, and then adhesive applied to the, to the concrete, and then the two surfaces brought together. And then once they've been brought together, a little bit of Kent ledge over the top, just to put a little bit of pressure and extrude a little bit of um, adhesive from the, from the sides. You can see these half moons being placed on the external columns um, and there was two plates obviously for the internal columns to completely sort of encapsulate the base of the, uh, of the column. This is Volney flyover in Sussex. This one was carried out in 1992 for the Department of Transport. Four span bridge, 676 plates used and they were 360 millimetres wide. <coughs> the biggest plate bonding project ever undertaken on a bridge to this day using steel plates. And you can see the plates going across the underside of the, uh, of the deck and these transverse beams using there to just support the ends and the, remain and the plates before they were pre-drilled for um, the anchor bolts to be placed in. <coughs> and you can see the finished job there. As we said earlier on, very limited to sort of five metres length of plate. Uh, so therefore, we have to lose use um, laps here, but again they were then coated and uh, if you go under there now, unless you're looking for it specifically, you wouldn't know that it would even been strengthened. This is uh, a bridge in Suffolk, it's actually for Suffolk County Council and there were cast iron girders and uh, so this is quite, quite unique, it's actually now we're strengthening steel, not just uh, concrete. Uh, 100, 400 kilogram mild steel plates were placed under the, uh, underneath each arch and then they were sort of held on with brackets to hold the, um, the plate in place during curing but they were 
subsequently left that in position as well. Same preparation to the, the, the cast iron as we did to the uh, steel <coughs> plates, SA2.5, corrosion protection applied, placed into position, and then coated with, uh, with corrosion protection. And uh, rather than hide it, they thought they'd enhance it, hence they coated it in, uh, in red. So we start to get on to the FRP pioneering work, now, uh, pioneering work now, and this was first looked at in 1984 by, um, uh, by EMPA, who were based in, in Switzerland. And they are the Swiss Federal Laboratories of Material Testing and Research. <coughs> They're very much, I suppose, similar to our Royal Military College of Science. And they did lots of tests with, with um, <coughs> our adhesive particularly and carbon fibre, <coughs> on lots of different size beams and configurations to just <coughs> understand, try and understand the mode of failure, how they, how they worked in, in comparison to steel plates. So Emperor, which sort of, uh, they had the composite expertise and the evaluation capability with all their laboratory equipment. And of course, we had the adhesive technology. And so we were the sort of partners when we started to look at FRP strengthening. And the other thing is we've had so much experience with adhesives also for bonding segmental bridges together, even before we started to work on steel plate bonding. So our sort of, um, <coughs> our knowledge was, was quite vast. So hopefully now you've, you've seen why, why sort of uh, steel plates were, have been used in, uh, previously and that it is a proven technique now, no question about that. Uh, technique's very cost effective. We've been uh, involved in developing not only the steel plate bonding system in the UK now, but also the FRP system, which is just that next sort of uh, innovative step that we've taken to strengthening. And certainly the adhesives, <coughs> which <coughs> shouldn't be underestimated in the part they play in that joint, has to be the right adhesive. And we, quite clearly we, we surpass the uh, sort of specification spectrum that's been um, suggested by Professor Jeff Mays. So that's me concluded for this one.